You're listening to Mortgage Lending Mastery. Get the knowledge you need to advance your mortgage practice quickly and efficiently from Jen Duplessis, America's Mortgage Mastery Mentor with over 37 years of experience and over $1 billion in lifetime funding. Jen has been mentoring loan officers and realtors for over 15 years and speaking on stages across the globe. So settle in and get ready as Jen and her guests share their experience passion and strategies to help you crack the top producer code to reach new heights in your business. And now here's your host, Jen Duplessis, mortgage mastery mentor and head chicken charge of kinetic spark consulting. Hey everyone, welcome back to Mortgage Lending Mastery. I'm your host, Jen Duplessis. Today, I am really excited. As you all know, I am a non-QM fan, right? I am so excited about uh, doing things differently. You know, as lenders and as real estate agents, our job is to do loans and help people with real estate, not necessarily the same single family home or condo. And this is one of the things that that really took my business over the top, you know, to be a um, hundred million dollar producer for multiple years um, is because I looked at these different types of products and I know it's competitive right now. This is why I felt that the timing was perfect to bring on one of my favorite companies, RCN Capital and Tim Herridge. Welcome to the show. Hey, Jen, how are you today? I'm great. I am great. So let me tell everyone a little bit about you. I think what's so unique about what you do um, is that most of the time we're bringing someone on who is part of a mortgage company, you know, they're in the mortgage business, but you actually took a different path. You've um, acquired over 2000 houses in your 21 year career. You're located in uh, the Dallas market. You're still buying um, 50 homes a year. And I know you're doing a variety of things with them. So we'll talk about what it is that you're doing, but um, you are the executive director of RCN Capital and the host of the Uncontested Investing Show, which I've got to find out, is that a podcast or is that a streaming show? We'll ask that in a few minutes, but you are a professional real estate investor and entrepreneur, um, and you are the co-founder and managing director of Blackstone's BRB, um, B B to R Finance. You know, anytime we say Blackstone, we love it. I have another company called Black Fox for that very reason. Um, and I have a friend who has red Fox and I told him, well, I'm not in the red, you are. <laughs> right? I'm in the black. Um, and you are the founder of the REI Expo. And for those of you that don't know what REI is, it's real estate investing, right? That's in, um, are you part of REIA at all? There's nothing in here about that. No, I'm not. Real event. Okay. So I'm curious about that. Let's go right there. Why are you not part of REIA? And it may be because of your tenure, but why should someone consider being part of it? Well, so there's so many RIAs out there. Um, and so there's the national RIA, which is a real estate, national real estate investor association. And I'm actually not a member of it right now because their Dallas chapter uh, that I was a member of uh, is no longer in existence. So oh, wow. Uh, and they're opening a new one, and I'll join as soon as they get reopened here in Dallas. Yeah. Uh, so the National RIA is it's chapter based, and you actually have to be a member of the chapter that's the nearest to you. Yeah, I love it. I was actually on the National RIA cruise several years ago, and so you know I love that they all go on a cruise and everybody, um, you know, goes one. there. It is. It's really fun. So I want to start off with your real estate investing career and, you know, again, give some context to people about why I feel that having these types of conversations with investors that I bring onto the show is so important. And that is that so often I see, and I'm sure you do too, uh, mortgage loan originators and real estate agents not actually investing in the product that they help people get. And I, in, for those of you that aren't watching, he's kind of smiling. <laughs> he's going, yeah, I don't get it. You know, why are, why is that, that this happens? What do you think is the reason? Yeah, I think it's the same reason so many investors flip the houses versus keep the houses. It, it's, <laughs> it's quick money, right? It, yeah. It's, it's, it's easier to go make a commission on something many times than it is to uh, delay that gratification. It's easier to, uh, get the origination on something uh, versus uh, acquiring it yourself. So, uh, and with investors, I mean, I, we we still make this decision after 20 years in the business. Sometimes you can make a quick, 
yeah. 50 grand and it's easy and fun. Uh, so I, I think a lot of it has to do with delayed gratification, but the other is just, uh, you know, I mean, I think too many entrepreneurs, which, you know, that's the f fun thing about real estate is all, we're all entrepreneurs. Uh, too many entrepreneurs just don't have a good plan to build wealth and uh, work towards retirement. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, uh, you know, especially in the industry that we're in, it's just, you know, rush, 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 rush around all the time. And there's not enough time. Um, you know, there's this thing I teach called the four stages of growth, which is formulation, concentration, momentum, and stability. And I think that people are always in this concentration, momentum, concentration, momentum, that the last thing they want to do is stop and learn something new. And because look, you're going to make mistakes. <laughs> there's no question about it. Um, but I think the sooner you can do this, the better. So um, yeah, thanks for the insight on that. That's interesting that you're saying, you know, it's a quick buck. Um, it's funny because I'm going to share something else too. You know, I've, I've done one fix and flip and I did it because I bought it as a tax lien and I had to do it. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a fan of fix and flip because it's for me, it's quick money. I get that it's quick money. But to me, I, it's akin to having to search for a, a mortgage deal, right? Yep. I'm, I'm just going next deal, next deal. I'm unemployed unless I have a fix and flip. I'm unemployed unless I close a loan or close real estate. And I want that mailbox income. <laughs> right? You know, 20 years into this business and I've been, I, you get asked a lot, as you know, what's the, uh, what's, your, what's your, your number one piece of advice these days? And as I look back at it, I believe that the answer is simply one more, because if I would had just kept one more, one more a year, one more quarter, one more every five years, whatever the answer is. But for me, I look at 20 years. If I'd kept one more house per year, you're looking at the difference in $10 million in asset value. Yeah. And it's just huge. And so that's, that's what I'm telling everyone right now is just whatever your plan is, just try to find, because the old, you know, the old adage, right? You don't wait to buy real estate. You buy real estate and wait. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. And you, that it goes again to the, the instant gratification. I yeah. think one of the reasons that realtors and loan officers uh, don't, uh, well, I shouldn't say don't like if you're sharing a house with, you're showing a house uh, with someone who's a potential real estate investor for the first time, they are always looking for positive cash flow. Right. Got to have it. And if I don't have it, I don't want to invest. Even a $25 negative cash flow, if there's enough appreciation and you can, look, stop getting two cups of coffee <laughs> a week, right? And and especially if you have a job, right? You're not relying on it. Go for the negative and get the appreciation so that you could use that one home to sell and split and buy two others that do have positive cash flow. Well, a very high percentage of real estate investors, people that own more than one home are licensed real estate agents, a mm -hmm. very high percentage. And um, at one point it was over 70 and I think it's just, you've got all these tools, right? You understand financing, you understand property condition and sales, or at least you're getting there. You may be newer. And I think it's just, uh, like you said, Jen, just expanding your mind to another area, another method of income. Uh, uh, on the podcast, uh, Uncontested Investing, we talked about earlier, my second guest ever said, he said the best advice he was ever given and you had to go back and you should routinely look at your income and your net worth. And mm -hmm. if one's growing faster than the other, you have a balance problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, uh, you know, that becomes somewhat of an issue. I have to tell you, it just reminded me, I was just coaching one of my clients and she said, I'm actually doing a home inspection on my first investment property. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she's been in the mortgage business for 17 years. First one. Right. Look at all that opportunity that was lost when, you know, we have our heyday and we go out and spend the money instead of utilizing and reallocating it to something. Yeah. So I think that's, that's pretty incredible. So let's, I want to talk before we go into mortgage stuff, uh, because I do want to talk about that too, but what, um, what kind of investing are you doing or have you done? I know, you know, that RCN does fix and flips and buy and holds and multifamily and all kinds of, of, of great private, you know, financing, but where, where did you start? Where are you at now? What are you thinking you're going to be doing in the future? Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's been the evolution. When I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, I, I got a job as a, yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
I got a job as a project manager for a home flipper here in Dallas and mm. worked for him for a year and then took a job for another home flipper and uh, as his kind of buyer, his acquisitions or sales rep, and uh, then just went out on my own and took that leap of faith. And, you know, you, you start off flipping, you know, fix and flip and trying to wholesale some properties, just moving those contracts. And, uh, but I, I, from, from the beginning, I, I've always been uh, someone that goes around these networking events and just meets everyone I can. And, the people that you could tell had a lot of money, had a lot of houses. And mm -hmm. from the beginning, it was just a priority of mine to start banking some away. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, you know, the tax code's not great to us. It, when, when, when you're looking at 1099 sales, commission income uh, folks, and, and if we don't, and we don't have retirement accounts. So often, you know, so many realtors and loan officers don't have 401k. No, because the job hopping and whatever, right. or, or they're all segmented. They're not growing. So yeah. I just, I understood that I, I didn't want to work forever. And I understood that uh, I, I just believed in real estate. And so we started keeping houses as early as 03, which was my second year in the business. And uh, it's just amazing because you look back and you're like, wow, uh, mm -hmm. I wish I'd kept more. Um, so, you know, fast forward, I've, I've flipped, I've ran conventions. Uh, I was a home investors guy the Weeb Ugly Houses Company. Yeah. Um, I was actually one of their largest development agents in the nation. I had 40 offices across the nation. Um, but, you know, you fast forward to now, my wife and I mainly Airbnbs, uh, mm -hmm. traditional rentals, and then some fix and flip stuff just for fun because she does enjoy the transformation, right? She, my, yeah, she, decorating. Well, it's better that she moves everything around in someone else's house than yours. Well, yeah, and she's <laughs> great at it, right? So, and, and when you when you find something that you can yeah. make money at and you enjoy and that you're actually good at, like, why yeah. not do it? Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I would say the bulk of our focus these days is on developing high cash flow, unique properties that we can use combination strategies between traditional rentals, Airbnbs, and even uh, some traveling nurses, temporary housing, all of those different income streams where we can capitalize on uh, the mobility of the American workforce. Yeah. Yeah. And you should include retreats and masterminds in that. Yeah. Um, because, uh, so I want to talk about that. Let's talk about that for just a minute. Okay. Um, you, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, no. No, I said, I, um, okay, let's talk about it. Yeah. So I, you know, as I was talking to my client today, I said, oh, are you going to rent this? Or are you going to Airbnb it? What's the scoop? You know, now this property uh, is in between two uh, military installations, you know, down in Virginia beach. And so she's like, you know, I want to do long-term rental. And I said, well, that's smart because you know, you're going to get paid because otherwise they have to go to their, their senior officer is why they didn't make their payment. So it's all good. But um one of the strategies that my husband and I did is that, you know, we had done step investing for years and years and years and rolling everything into paying off the mortgages. Um, you know, as a mortgage lender, most people are like, oh, you should, you know, um, leverage as much as you can. And we definitely have leveraged some of them, but we paid most of them off. And, and then what we did is we offered the property to uh, the renters as land contracts so that I didn't have to be a landlord anymore. So we've done that with most of those. Some of those that we had lingering around, we converted to a Airbnbs where we could, because I know there, there's guidelines all over the place. So we've conver converted those to Airbnbs. And um, now our strategy is Airbnb land contracts, Airbnb land contracts. And um, everything that we bought recently, we've just paid with cash, although it's not cash, you need to know that. Uh, we paid with cash and um, and we're just land contracting. You know, we're just right. getting that mailbox income without having to worry about the property. Um, so what are you seeing, uh, given the fact that you have one strategy, I have a kind of similar but different strategy. What are you seeing come across your desk at RCN as being the most, I, I hate the word popular, but the most trending now? What's trending right now? Well, you're seeing a lot, you're seeing loan amounts go down. Um, when interest rates have gone up as much as they have recently, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it makes it more difficult to cash flow those larger properties. I think you're, we're seeing a lot of one of our clients just sent over a multi-million dollar acquisition in the Bay Area that, you know, he was buying for 50% loan to value with, wow. when five months ago, he would have paid 80% loan to value. 
single we're seeing family? Better this can't be single, single family. family. Yeah. Oh, really? So we're seeing better deals. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, just like mm -hmm. the lenders across the spectrum tightened up some of the cash flow requirements and tightened up some of the loan to value and loan to cost requirements, our customers did the same thing. They reduced their purchase loan to values in order to uh, accommodate the reduced leverage, but also uh, the market instability. Yeah. Yeah. What's the hottest market you're seeing right now? Yeah, I really can't narrow it down to one, but it, it, it's it's still kind of the Rust Belt and the Sun Belt. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Workforce housing, you know, where the median home price is still below 400000 uh, People are just flocking there. It's just, it's still lots of building activity still in the northern Florida, all the way to Georgia, the Carolinas, uh, just uh, everywhere. It's, yeah. uh, we, we see a lot of, first time home buyer band price band homes at RCM, because that's, I think that's where our customers focus. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you're making that investment and it's your first time or maybe multitudes of times, you know, it's just easier to have lower risks spread out amongst other, you know, properties and stuff. Um, I definitely get that. I'm surprised because I know for RCN, you know, for so long, I mean, a lot of the emails that I would receive and saying, hey, here's the deals that we did this week. And by the way, I love that email because it says, oh, that's possible. This is possible. This is how it was structured. Um, you know, a lot of that was coming from New England. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the company's background. We're headquartered in Connecticut. Right. Uh, right. So, so we, we've got a lot of friends up there. Um, but uh, yeah, we, uh, from Ohio to Texas to Florida, Lots in California, um, but yeah, really that Rust Belt, Sun Belt is kind of the bellwether right now. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what you see in the future for investors, and then we'll talk a little bit about non-QM. I know some people that are listening, this is the first time they might be hearing about it. Others might be reintroduced. We need to really hone in on why it's so important to be considering right. um, alternative financing, but let's talk about... What do you think is happening moving forward for investors? We know there was a lot of drying up of good properties. Loan amounts were dropping because the properties were just nasty. Um, so what are you seeing? What do you think is going to happen? Well, I mean, as recent as this week, you've seen home building permits down 10%. Mm -hmm. um, you're looking at net new listings down 5% in the last month or so. Days on the market have creeped up to about half of normal. Um, so we're still faced with a massive supply crisis. And since there's a whole lot less being built and a whole lot less put being put on the market, it, it, the reduced demand is really just being absorbed by the less supply. Yeah. Um, there, there, there's some outliers and I tell everyone right now, like percentages are, are the most dangerous thing you can read. Yes, I um, know. <laughs> for instance, yeah. I tell the story a lot. I was at a mastermind and, and a gentleman said, the Boise market's going to SHIT. And I was like, really? I hadn't heard that. And I'm Googling and days on the market up 100%. I'm like, oh, wow, that's bad. And it had gone from four to eight. I know. <laughs> and, and it's just like, I, I just, I feel like more of us professionals need to learn to read the underlying data and understand it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but I go all the way back cause I made it through the great recession, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, yep. when you start really honing your craft on ab absorption rate, right? The, the active listings versus the sold listings. And you start looking at, uh, median home price, uh, average dollar per square foot year over year. I actually have not found a single metropolitan statistical area where the average dollar per square foot of sold listings is less than it is right now. Yeah. It was less this time last year than it is right now. It yeah. may have been a little more in April or May of this year, but as you know, real estate's very seasonal. And so I like data, you know, when I, and, and so I, I feel like, I still feel like the week of June 23rd was kind of the peak on interest rates. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, there's just not enough institutional quality paper for these bond investors to buy. And I just feel, I, I believe that we're, we're nearing an election cycle mm -hmm. and uh, 
inflation is a year over year metric. We're about to be benchmarking against some of the worst ever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just feel like, you know, and, and I've been to four masterminds in the last uh, month and a half and everybody says the same, you said kind of a little pause period earlier. I, I summarized it for our CEO the other day like this. I said, Jeff, I feel like there's just a lot of cautious optimism in the market. Yeah. I think yeah. we all know that there's 5 million, we need 5 million houses today just to take care of the existing demand. Yeah. Um, and everybody's got to adjust a little bit to these quote unquote high interest rates, even though historically they're still low. It's still and, great. Yeah. I know. So I, I don't know. I mean, my crystal ball tells me that we peaked in June. I think we're choppy for the rest of 2022. And by then, you know, and there's also a lot of a uh, foreign uh, influence over this because there's a lot of countries that are already talking about cutting their rates again. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think we're not on an island. I think that 22 will be a little more choppy, which is good for an investor. You know, because, oh, sorry, your audience, <laughs> there's a lot of people panic selling right now. Yeah. They're, they're afraid they missed the boom. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the hedge funds pulled out of the acquisitions market. They didn't pull out of buying permanently, but it's a falling knife. And if it's a falling knife, let the thing fall. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I feel like there's a real good opportunity right now for someone that understands house values uh, and lending to step in and pick up a property or two that is at a significant discount to what it was three or four months ago. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you have to have your eye on the market every single day and being prepared. This is, I think, part of it too, is that um, I see this a lot because I do this type of financing, right? Uh, I see this a lot where uh, people are kind of driving around and they're like, oh, the price dropped. So maybe we'll be an investor. We'll go ahead and start trying. And the right. problem the problem is you need, this is so counterintuitive to the way we normally do business, which is call you on a Sunday. I need a pre-approval letter. Boom, 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 boom. It's done. It's not done that way in this world. It's done the opposite way. You have to get your ducks in a row. So it's now, if you call this a lull period, a slow period, a choppy period, where we're kind of just waiting for September 21st, what's going to happen? How much are, you know, the Fed's going to raise rates and how is that going to have an impact? We have another inflationary number that's coming out as well. What, uh, while we're waiting, get your ducks in a row and be ready to strike when the iron's hot. And if something does sit for a little longer and you see a reduced price, then you know you can go in and buy it. A very large institutional purchaser that I'm close with literally is doing that same thing. They bought hundreds and hundreds of houses earlier this year, and they had a plan to buy thousands more. They took a pause, mm -hmm. but their pause isn't they're at home with their feet up, mm -hmm. right? They're reorganizing, they're hiring, training, working out inefficiencies. And I even go as far as to just the solopreneur, uh, a friend of mine from a, one of the masterminds I go to text me today. Hey, can you close this loan for me on Friday? I'm <laughs> like, I'm probably, <laughs> but have you ever turned in your LLC docs? No, I haven't started the process. Well, yeah. then no, there's no way, right? Yeah. If you've already let us look at your LLC docs and had us run your credit and let us look at your bank statements. And it's kind of, like you said, if you've gotten ready, mm -hmm. things happen fast in this yeah. world, but if you're not ready, don't, don't try to run the race. Yeah. And I think particularly in the non-QM world, you can kind of get away with it on the traditional financing, you know, because you can't put your, your property in the name of an LLC. And, you know, there's always the story of, well, you can switch it later and you can make payments. And we know all the stories around that, but that's what makes it so special and so different in non-QM, you know, and I have a client right now that I'll, I'll be talking to you afterwards. I have a client right now that, that, uh, you know, he's got this big development and all this stuff. And he's like, you know, we're just panicking. We need to find financing. And it's like, wow, where have you been, you know, to put something that kind of pressure on me. And, and of course I don't allow it. Right. <laughs> I've been in the business too long, four, four right. decades. I won't be allowing that. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but um, okay. So thanks for your insight in that, you know, so this is, this is the time to, you know, talk to people, find out if they're interested in investing, if they want to sort of tap into this market. 
um, and let them know that you are a professional, you're ready to help and serve them. And this is a fine, a great time to hone in on your skills to know exactly what products are out there um, so that you don't miss some opportunities. So let's go right into what is it like for a individual loan officer to work with RCN versus a company working with RCN? Because I know you do both. Yeah, so we, so for those uh, those out there, we offer single family, multifamily, and mixed use, loans on single family, multifamily, and mixed use properties for fix and flip, long term rental, and ground up construction. Yeah, and we're in forty six states, and a very large portion of our business is done through brokers and correspondent lenders. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we have the best training in this product line. Uh, our marketing team just does an amazing job. I even actually went through the training, even though I didn't need it, but, (laughs) and I was so impressed because from terminology to products and learning to calculate some of the different uh, things, it really did show me that, you know, we're, we're committed to uh, really helping the, the brokers, the lenders, onboard our products and make their business better. So uh, typically if you're just signing up, if just an individual uh, loan officer, you'd probably want to sign up as a broker. Um, I I tell everyone it's kind of, I heard one of our business development people say this. So if you're just a referral partner, you make less and you do less. And if you're a broker, you make more and you do a little bit more. If you're willing to take the step and fill out all the paperwork and become a correspondent lender, you can do everything and make the most, right? And yeah. So it's it, it's just those are the three kind of uh, uh, programs, and uh, uh, we give you a dedicated rep. We've got a pro- pro- proprietary loan origination system, uh, the Bridge Loan Network that uh, you can use for our loans and other loans. Um, if you're working with other lenders in the kind of private lending space, uh, you know we can get brokers set up in a day or two. Correspondent lenders, you know, we have to re- review LLC docs and run credit and things like that. So it takes a little bit longer. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about the client. Well, before you do that, so someone's listening and they're like, why do I need this? Why do I need to even do this? Why, why are you pitching this company or any company who does non QM? Why does someone need this today? So a little more than 36% of the entire housing market is owned by real estate investors. And if you read the headlines, you would assume that the big institutions own most of them. It's right, right. When still to this day, 93%, I believe is the number, uh, a very low, more than 85%, I'll just say that, are owned by what they refer to as mom and pop investors, mm-hmm. meaning people with 10 or less houses. Yeah. And so the average homeowner purchases and sells 2.3 homes every seven years. Mm -hmm. The average investor purchases and sells a little over 7.5 homes every seven years. So if you just do the math, it's repeat customers and and, and, and loyal customers because we find, and at RCN, huge focus on customer service because what we find is with, as you know, and you said it earlier, these transactions have to happen fast. Mm -hmm. In relationships, are very important in these fast, high profit transactions. Yeah. And so we don't find that we lose our customers very often if we do what we say we're going to do. And we, you know, pick up the phone, right? (laughs) So I think, Uh. why does someone need this? Repeat customers, high volume. And they also love to refer their friends because they go around and brag about how many houses they have. Yeah. And I think this is expansion of your practice. You know, as I said before, is like if you are a mortgage loan officer or a real estate investor, then you should be doing all types of things, you know, and not just this one. And I get I get that you need to have a niche. I get that. Uh, but this is an opportunity. You know, it was funny. I was at a non-QM conference uh, last year and invited this year, but I couldn't make it. And it was amazing how many people, how many loan officers were coming in going, OK, so now I've got to learn this. And at that time, I said, look, you know, during COVID, you have short term gain for long term pain. And now we're in the long term pain. It's competitive. Rates have gone up. What do I do? Where am I going to get business? If you had taken the time to learn this a year and a half ago, you would just be humming right along. 
Well, and I think also this is something we've talked to some of our newer loan officers that have been here at RCM for less than a year. Look, last year was like being an order taker in the mm -hmm. lending business yep. because rates were insanely stupidly low yep. that all you had to do is like, yeah, sure. I'll send you a rate sheet. And now some of the newer folks that haven't been through other cycles uh, are, are learning, Oh, we have to sell. Right. And I think real estate agents are learning the same thing. And to me, the Chinese symbol for chaos and opportunity are identical. Yes, And I think that those out there that are taking the time to listen to a show like yours, if they'll invest in their processes, invest in their knowledge, invest in their customer service, invest in having a good CRM, a good process, a good procedure. Actually and learning honing their, their sales skills. Yeah. yeah. I mean, having a marketing plan. Mm -hmm. I remember like, so I'm married to a real estate broker. It's how we met. Uh, and during the foreclosure crisis, you know, the whole thing was you had to go in with your pitch book and show them all the all the websites you were going to put the house on and all right. that. Right. And, you know, the last three years, they've just walked in and said, yeah, how much do you want? You know, yeah. and, and, and so I think this is an opportunity for the cream to rise to the top. No and question. if people are willing to invest in themselves and invest in their skill set, they will come out of this in a very dominant position. Yeah. I agree. So let me ask you a question at our at RCN. Are you doing only investor non-QM or are you doing owner occupied as well? We are a commercial lender. We only loan money to Invest businesses for business purposes. So it's yeah. only investment property. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Got that. Thank you. And by the way, those that are listening here, you know, that's a niche. If you go to business owners who couldn't show on their tax returns because of COVID, <laughs> because of the pandemic, they can't show on their tax returns, but they can show that, you know, through bank statements that they can receive money. This is the type of client that you should be looking at, um, you know, to get, to help them, to help them get financing and help them take advantage of, of today's low rates or the equity, right, that they've gained in, in some of their properties. Uh, okay. So, um, when it comes to the type of properties that you lend on, uh, what are you seeing is now, I think I know the answer to this question because I work in a lot of syndications, but what are you seeing coming across your, your desk? Are you seeing a lot, a lot more, you know, is it just single family one-offs? Is it uh, ground up development or is it some of these more multifamily conversions? Um, what is it? Yeah. So it, it, it's been interesting what we're seeing that we're winning the bid on is the traditional, I, I tell my offices, the cookie cutter, bread and butter, three, two, two brick home. Gotcha. Uh, I think investors are still really bullish on these houses. Many places in the United States, you can still buy for less than you could build it for. Yes. Right? The, the, the resale value in a fully fixed up home is less than the replacement cost of that home. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we still see significant investment in that kind of asset band. Um, multifamily has been really interesting. And I'm like you, I invest in syndications as well. And, you know, you can't have cap rates less than interest rates. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and so there's been a lot of retrades. There's been a lot of uh, uh, fallout. We've had a lot of people... Um, we're really good in the multi-space, kind of that five to 20 unit space. Uh, we fill the void between single family and Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, right? We're yeah, small balance. Course. Yeah. Um, mixed use, we're not hardly seeing at all. And our and uh, new construction, we had really high hopes for that product line this year. Oh yeah, because you did, you came up with a new product. I remember last time I saw Jeff, yeah. Yeah and, yeah. and, and, the small builders have just pulled back so much. Yeah. It, um, inflation. Yeah. So, well, now, you know, they say we have too many building materials now. I, it's just, I think. <laughs> They're all in Salt Lake. I was just there last week and I was like, those, so this is where all the new construction is because they're just going up all over the place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So new construction has been slow and it, it was something I talked to Jeff about the other day. I was like, I just, it doesn't make sense. Uh, but um, uh, just people have, have, have it, when you look at the report from this morning, people have pulled back mm -hmm. and they're not really actively 
building anywhere near as much as they were. And a lot of people are a little bit debt adverse right now yeah. because they, they don't want to pay high rates or not high, higher rates, or they're sitting on a lot of cash. So they might, they'd rather just use their cash to maximize profit. Yeah. And I think the inflationary part of it too is, you know, how far will your dollar go? Uh, really not capturing it. It's funny. I I bought a, I've said, mentioned this on this podcast. I bought a house for $9,400 in Thayer, Illinois, right. And turn it into a, um, a land contract. I didn't do a single thing to this awful house, <laughs> but I have a nurse who's living in it. And uh, you know, she's, her family's helping her renovate and do all that stuff. But you know, when I, when I did the financing, when I started working with her, um, it was, I think in like February or March and, you know, the rate on it's 8%. And I thought, yes. And now I think, no. Right. And so when we look, I mean, this is part of the secondary market anyway. And what mortgage backed securities are all about is that if I'm going to lend it out again, I'm not going to lend it out at 8% in today's market. Right. right. And so, because my dollar is not going as far for the income that I'm receiving every month and I'm saying, oh, now I'm locked in, but I'm not locked in very long, which is good. You know, that's a good thing. Um, multifamily. I think this is something that scares people and there's a lot of it out there just that everybody knows there's quite a bit out there. I think it scares real estate agents and loan officers who've not dabbled in that market. You know, there's, they're typically this, you know, SFR one to four, right. Single family right. residents, one to four. Um, what are some things that they might need to know if they were going to tap into that market and start talking to people, you know, with multifamily and I get it. Some markets don't even have multifamily. It's so hard. You know, like I know I'm from Colorado and duplexes and fourplexes are the norm. Right. When you're here in Northern Virginia, that's not the norm. You don't find duplexes and, and fourplexes, at least, no. you know, in the general area, you might find it more closer to DC. So when someone runs a process or decides, they know, hey, I want to get a little more sophisticated. I want to kind of get involved in these, these uh, multifamilies. What are some of the stumbling blocks or the, the triggers or, you know, hidden things that they need to know in order to get in it? Too many of our customers resist math uh, <laughs> and and ultimately you're talking about dscr aren't you <laughs> yeah in cap rates and and, yeah, and, yeah. and and ultimately once you go past the well not even by, when you look at a homeowner right there's a number and right. that number is their income mm -hmm. and then you figure out how what their expenses are and you figure out the debt to income ratio Mm -hmm. well, I think what people that are listening could do is educate themselves a little bit more on the different uh, uh, calculations that go into investment property. Right. So we use debt service coverage ratio, mm -hmm. which we kind of broke down and changed the way we say it. We call it the property debt to income ratio. Yeah. Right. So property debt to yeah. income ratio. Right. right. Because if right. I'm not going to look at Jen's W2 or 1099 mm -hmm. as a source of repayment, yeah, I've got to have a source of repayment. Right. So we look at the income on the Gross property income yeah. and, you know, then we divide that by the, you know, uh, the pro proposed principal, the proposed interest, the estimated taxes, the estimated insurance, and any estimated homeowners associations. Right. And that gives us the debt, you know, the desired debt to income ratio or the yeah. property, property debt to income ratio. Mm -hmm. And so what we see is, and then also I have to say this, pie in the sky doesn't get you a loan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you can't, if you're a homeowner, you can't go get a loan like, yeah, I make 50 right now. But I'm pretty sure I'll make a hundred next year. Yeah. I, it's like, so get me a loan. Yeah. Me a loan. And so when you're looking at Airbnbs, for instance, if you have in place actuals, we give them heavy consideration. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're able to give you 80% of that, which, as you know, Jen, since you have Airbnbs, is a lot more than market rents. Oh, yeah, a lot. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. But you can they, make money over a weekend, what you could do in a full month. Right. But if you don't have any actuals and the mm -hmm. property's never been used for that and you don't have experience in that area, mm -hmm. we as a lender, someone that you're telling, hey, I want, I want money for 30 years. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've got to have the math behind that. 
uh, we as a lender, we look more at the actual market rents because as everybody on this call knows, you can get that from an appraisal from a 10, was it 1004? Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Uh, um, oh, it's been a while. It's yeah. a, I don't know, the thing on the appraisal, the yeah. market rents a dummy. Yeah. Uh, we can get that from an appraiser. We can't no get, four. yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah. We can't get it from, uh, and, and AirDNA is one of those things. If you're listening and you're thinking about buying uh, income property, AirDNA, AirDNA, MASH Advisor are good tools. Mm -hmm. But the, I, I have found they are, as a practitioner and as a mm -hmm. lender, I found that they're not reliable tools. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, verify, I mean, trust, but verify, right? right. That's exactly what it would be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, learning that from a company like you, and I know there's a couple of other companies that provide some training, it's worth it going to those. It's worth it finding some conferences that are just for commercial. And you might go in there going, I thought I knew every acronym in the lending and real estate space until I get and you find out there's a lot more acronyms to be to be learned and you know really just absorbing this information before you go out there and start. And again, this is you know I was talking about those four stages of growth, right? It's the tendency is um, concentration, concentration, which really is a shiny object syndrome. So you know I don't want you to when you're listening here, I don't want you to go, oh, another shiny object. That's the, that's the magic pill. That's the thing that's going to take me. Because if you go into concentration to try to create momentum, you're going to fall on your tushy, right? You step back and you formulate, right? You right. were, you, you learn, you learn the resources, the tools, the people to help you, the things that you could overcome, um, the challenges that you could have, right? Um, and then you go concentrate. Then you, know you go concentrate. You know, when I met Blackstone in 2013 and we started B2R Finance, we had no idea what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. We just knew we were going to do portfolio loans for real estate investors. Yeah. And they brought me in as the translator. I understood the customer, but I didn't know a dang thing about right. commercial real estate finance. Yeah. And what made me successful in that role was I was willing to raise my hand and stop everyone at the table and say, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. And because... If I'm the guy that's bought a thousand houses at that time, this was mm -hmm. nine years ago, and I don't know what you're talking about, the customer's not going to have a clue. Right. Right. And, and so I think people have to just be willing to, you know, put themselves out there and formulate that plan and, and seek the knowledge and, and not let it intimidate them. And uh, if you'd have told me when I got out of the Marine Corps that, I would be a part of taking a company public and then I'd be joining a company like RCN and I would own as much real estate as I own. I would have laughed. I wanted to be a state trooper. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so uh, <laughs> I think, you know, baby steps and having that formulation. I like that, Jen. That, that, that's just key. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. And then, you know, you concentrate a little bit, you kind of it gets a little wonky, right? You, you stumble a little bit and you go back to some formulation, redirect, try it again. Some parts will get momentum. You know, there's, there's just a strategy and this is in all things that, you know, when I'm coaching my clients, this is what we talk about is all these, all these right. different strategies. Cause the shiny object syndrome is an acronym of SOS. Help me. I'm dying. I'm dying out here. Right. And so anytime someone says, oh my God, it's the coolest thing. I go, is that an SOS? <laughs> because I can say shiny object, but I'm going to say, is it an SOS? Right. Um, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I know you made the transition, you know, and in, into helping people with this. If you were a loan officer, or a real estate agent right now, and you're brand new, you haven't done a thousand, 2000 homes, you haven't been involved with Blackstone, you haven't done that. And you were, you know, brand new. You've just kind of done the same thing that everybody else does for years and years. Why? would you want to do this for your long-term future? I think I'm a student of society. And in the Marine Corps, we studied the Sun Tzu art of war. Why do people do what they do? I believe we have a permanent shift taking place in the United States where people, they want to be gig workers. They want to work from home. They want to live with their parents, multi-generational housing, and I'm not saying that I think we get to a 50-50 um, owner versus renter. Uh, you know, we're still well over 63%, I think, um, right now, homeowners versus uh, uh, landlords. But I think it's going to keep growing. And at the end of the day, 
there with with inflation occurring the way it is and there being a massive housing shortage a bulk of the transactions will continue to be investors so even though investors are half the transactions it's not half the housing stock you just have to realize a lot of the housing stocks not going to continue to turn because right. if Jen lives in a 200,000 house she paid 200,000 for 4 years ago yeah she can sell it for 400 right now but so she's got she to pay 400 for another one yeah what is so she going to buy yeah. i think people have to understand that you know we're in a we're in a stage of the cycle where homeowners owner occupants will consolidate or not transition or move and a large part of the market will be of the active market, I should say, will be real estate investors. And why would you if why would you ever want to turn a customer away? Yeah. That's my that's my philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And again, you know, looking at this for yourself as well is that you should be investing in the product that you're selling, if at all yeah. possible, to yeah, create I mean, wealth for yourself. I mean anyone that's owned properties for longer than five years at this stage, uh, when they run their uh, annual net worth calculation, uh, I, I guarantee you they go to the, a nice steak dinner that night. Um, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 yeah. it, appreciation is a game changer and the tax benefits are really nice too. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can tell you that, you know, if I was, well, there's a lot of pieces. I'm just saying one aspect of, you know, if I wasn't a real estate investor, I would not have been able to exit the mortgage business, you know, as a loan originator after 40 years um, at the age of 52, right? Or 55. Let's see, when did I do this? Yeah, 55. <laughs> at the age of 55. Because I would have always said, oh, as much as, you know, um, I love the business. You can tell I love the business, right? I'm right. very passionate about this. I love it. But as much as I love it, I was tired. It's like you in the Marine Corps, right? After a certain amount of years, you're done. After a certain amount of years of teaching, you're done. As a certain amount of years of being a trooper, you're done. And for me, I had, I had gone my course and there was so much more that was out there for me to be able to do. And I've seen so many people be so miserable for years and years and years because they don't have an exit strategy. And for me, that was my exit strategy. I knew, well, in fact, forget all the properties. All we had to do was rent this house out because this is on Airbnb, my house, rent this house out twice a month. And it made our mortgage payment. So we haven't made our mortgage payment in almost five and a half years. Right. Now we've made our mortgage payment. <laughs> right, but we You're haven't had to do it. Yeah, we haven't had to do it. So regardless of what I'm doing in my new career and regardless of the properties we have, this house sustains itself. And, and I had a strategy, you know, and so my husband's still in the mortgage business. So whatever he brings in is icing on the cake. Whatever I bring in is icing on the cake. And it's it's a great place to be in. And I really want people to understand that do what you're doing now, be really successful in what you're doing now, expand where you can to get grab as much as you can, be different in the marketplace, but be looking at the long term, that horizon. And you, Tim, are a perfect example of what that can look like for people. Yeah, I mean, I I, I do not have a super high education. I, I'm just I'm just a simple person that put the time in, uh, literally started out by swinging hammers yep. and, 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 and we have so many customers that are the same story, mm -hmm. male, female, all different backgrounds. Uh, it, it, it's there, the barriers of entry to owning investment property have never been as low as they are right now. And people like RCN and, uh, our, our partners, we're working to make it easier because, we believe it is a stable asset class that is predictable. And uh, I, I think it's, it's a permanent shift. It's not going away. And anyone that wants to put their head in, their sand, head in the sand and uh, think it is, it's not. Uh, so uh, buy four houses and you're in the top 20%. <laughs> yep, just like that. Yep. <laughs> I know, just like that. I love it. Well, Tim, is there anything you'd like to leave us with um, on how we can contact you or any thoughts that you'd like to leave with everyone? Yeah, uh, just hop on over to rcncapital.com. You can find all, our, all of our information there. We're all over social media as well. And I, I think, you know, Jen, as, I, as I, 
I, I've had a great time today. And I think what everybody just needs to know is, is we may be in a lull, but we're not, in, in personal opinion, we're not in a crash. And I don't think there's a crash coming. I don't think and, so. And yeah. uh, delay some gratification, invest in yourself, mm -hmm. not only from your knowledge base, but also from your personal net worth. And uh, probably the most important thing I've heard you say all day is, is you, you got to have an exit strategy from everything. Yeah. Yeah. Not your marriage. Well, no, no. I've been married 39, <laughs> 39 years. I'm okay. <laughs> I uh, yeah. Know. I mean, I, I think plan for your future, have an exit strategy in mind and, and realize that uh, although you probably could work till you're dead, you don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and whether you love the business or not, I mean, I think a lot of people love the business, but it's, you know, it's nice that you can choose. I think that was a big thing for me is that I wanted to exit on my terms. I yep. never wanted to exit because rates were too high. The market's too dead. I'm too old. Whatever the, whatever the case would be is I wanted to be in a position that I could exit on my own terms. And that's exactly what I did. And that's exactly what we want for everyone else is the ability to make more money and be able to allocate that money in a way that serves you instead of spending. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much, Tim, for being with us. I Thank love you, when you man. guys are on the show so much. And I, and I love bringing you back on occasion because it, it just, you know, reiterates and generates uh, new opportunities for people. And that's exactly what we're trying to do on Mortgage Lending Mastery. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for taking time to listen to us today. Just a quick reminder, scroll down on your phone, write a review, give us a great five-star rating and say something great about Tim <laughs> and what you learned from him today. I love looking at those reviews. And as a reminder, you can go to thetopproducercode.com. We're having a three-day virtual event coming up here shortly. We have another one coming up in November uh, that is not virtual. It's in person here in Northern Virginia. So make sure you get yourself signed up for that so you can learn more strategies on how to master the mortgage business and the real estate business. And we look forward to talking to you on the next episode of Mortgage Lending Mastery. Thanks for listening to Mortgage Lending Mastery. Be sure to subscribe to hear more sales tips, ideas, strategies, and tactics to help you with your personal and professional growth to multiply your results in record time. And if you like what we're doing, don't forget to give us a rating and review so we can continue to bring you the best content possible. Wanting more beyond the podcast? Join our Mortgage Lending Mastery membership community where you will find extended interviews with our favorite guests, weekly training, tips, and insider secrets, fireside chats with Jen, free content, meet, share, and collaborate with other members, and so much more. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about this exclusive content. Mortgage Lending Mastery is an industry syndicate charter podcast. Industry Syndicate is the first podcast network specifically for the mortgage and real estate industries. Get the Industry Syndicate app in the App Store or Google Play today.